So, good afternoon. Get in, take a seat, so we can start. Well, um, I have the pleasure to talk about some things in the Spring ecosystem. And my talk is called Exploring Spring Boot Client, which actually like, will take you back a little bit in time and also explore like, what the new things are there. And you probably have seen today a few talks already where they were using AI and things like that. I'm not going to use that. I'm going to show you like things which were there in the I mean, in the past, which are still there and so on. And I will also give you in the end some advice like which kind of clients you should actually use these days. So I hope to explain you a bit the differences between the different clients in Spring Boot, the different styles, the patterns which are used and how they evolved over time. And it's also interesting to see that like some new clients uh, are showing up actually in the Spring ecosystem, which just fill a gap. And maybe you also get inspired when you're going to write something uh, where you would access something um, like a product or like something homegrown where you need to access it over an API or so, and you have to implement the client yourself. Maybe you get inspired also like in which direction uh, you should go like um, these days. So just to start with, yes, now, wow, it's not moving. But this part is moving. So let's find out. Maybe that just didn't have focus with my mouse. Yes. So um, my name is Patrick, and I'm also from Switzerland. So I'm actually like based in, in Zurich for work, mostly. And um, I'm doing quite a lot of spring stuff. So that means like for a long time, I do like spring trainings, consulting, reviews, whatever. And usually, I think the best thing what I do is to explain is I work with people on software. Uh, for people, obviously, but the point is like usually I coach also software teams to make software better and put them like faster into production. And besides that, I have some side hustles like lecturing at the University of Applied Sciences in Zurich, but as well, um, I'm really much involved in the software development community. And like one thing is I run with Federico as well, the Vox Day Zurich. So, yeah, that's about me. So, I want to talk today about the brief history about programming styles, like how things evolved. Just really, really brief. I want to want to take that short. Then actually, like we will discover together, like the three or four design patterns Spring uses for the clients. And then actually, like I will dive with you into code and explain you the different um, um, clients which are there, and also like in the different areas. And in the end, I want to summarize the whole thing. So that's actually like my goal for the presentation. Okay, so let's go back in time. I'm sure you know this one. And let's go back and think about like the brief history about um, programming styles. And I'm not talking about that, you know, it's not like pair programming in, in different flavors. Um, I'm going to talk about things like this one here. And I'm sure you know things like when, for example, um, structured programming started, when object-oriented programming was a thing, when declarative programming, like, for example, SQL started and so on. And nowadays, if you look at the bottom of the page, it's more like a mixture of everything. So we try to combine things, and um, that's also like very important to understand like how certain things evolved, especially if you look at, at data access or access at different APIs. And that means like the modern trends are like cloud related, obviously. We have like um, functional programming and things like this, and this actually also tells you like why we are using certain um, client types. I will talk about afterwards. For me, it's just like important to see uh, how things have started and to get you get an idea about that. And obviously, um, we have the same thing in Java. And also Java evolved quite a bit. And also like the latest, fe latest features, uh, which is now more like this data-centric or data-driven approach, uh, functional programming, new features with, um, for example, the records and patch matching, and all this stuff. And that means also like the way how we use code is actually changing. And for me, it's really that thing also to have in mind when we go further and think of like what we are using now to access like external APIs. 
So you see, there was quite a lot. And as you know, um, even in the Java world, things are still evolving and getting better. It's unbelievable what we, we have there at the moment. And I mean, we don't even know like how it will be in the future and like how this will evolve over time, right? And then actually, well, if you are talking about history, you have the same thing like in the Spring ecosystem. And you know that the, the Spring team was basically celebrating 20 years of Spring and 10 years of Spring Boot, which means like there is quite a bit of legacy there. I'm not really jumping into the details, but if you see here, like that the first version of um, Spring Framework was like uh, pushed to public or pushed to production, as um, <laughs> Josh Long would say, then actually, um, now we are like also like in 2024, like 20 years later, and Spring Boot started like 2014. That means like there is quite a lot, um, or quite a lot of things have happened there. And for me, the thing is just like that you memorize that everything started in 2004 with the first major release. I will show you like a thing which is there since 2000, I think, one. Yes, yes, for sure. You will be surprised. Okay, so why do you know all this? Or why, why do you need to know this? So for me, it was just like the idea that you get um, some refreshment of your memories, how things have changed. And as you also know, things are changing and we are living in a complex world. <laughs> and for example, if we are going to uh, access like services or databases or uh, whatever, REST API or email and so on, and we are dealing with enterprise applications, we need to have a way how to like write nice and maintainable code. So it, it's getting difficult. And the beauty about Spring is definitely like, if you know like one paradigm, you know the others. It's very easy to follow this. And there may be like a few, slight differences in APIs, but roughly you could say if you know like one thing, you know mostly like how the other things are working. And being that concise in APIs, in the framework and so on, that's just like, um, that's quality. That's like somebody spearheading these ideas and making sure that the code is concise and it's not just a pile of patches, right? <laughs> and that's definitely a thing and maybe it's, it's also like different what you would see during work in, in your code. But um, I would just say, hey, our life is actually complicated. The applications get more complex. Now we have new APIs, like all this AI coming and so on. And, and obviously also like we don't know what's going on in the future. Now, because of that, I want to focus first a little bit about um, some design patterns which should help you to understand like what I mean by this. And let's start, just start like with the first one. And the first one we need for Spring clients is like the template method pattern. You probably know that, that um, there are many templates in the Spring ecosystem and actually it's a behavioral design pattern and it's just like a skeleton for something to abstract and hide code away. And I think it's a very powerful thing, if you know how it works, that you could even build your own because it's super simple. Um, usually, well, as the definition says, you would actually subclass um, the template um, thing and would implement a specific implementation. But the Spring team actually took also another route uh, where they call the things callbacks. And they use callbacks actually also to basically um, transform certain things and also like do the things like where you would implement the business logic. I, I'm, I'm guessing you know what I mean. And I think that was a thing they introduced very early and it really makes um, sense actually to like hide a lot of infrastructure code. And imagine like if you have to deal with resource management, with error handling and all these kind of things, it's really nice that you just can do it like once and everyone who is using it can leverage from the things you have learned, probably in production, right? 
I mean, I implemented myself like a template and I found out that I have a bug in the error handling and some, some sessions did not get closed and we had like 7,000 connections open to production to, uh, on, the, on the firewall and then just things didn't work anymore. And just like with one fix, actually it was solved for all the applications. So that's actually like a very nice pattern. Another thing you are aware of that and Spring is famous for is actually like the, the proxy pattern. And the proxy pattern is used for many things. And usually it hides the cross-cutting concerns, as you know, like caching transactions and so on. But there are also clients in Spring which are based on the proxy and which just hides all this technical uh, behavior. So that means like you could implement the client and we just like specify an interface and that's it. And we just use the interface in our code, we compile against, and then the, the proxy is actually like doing the stuff behind the scenes, right? So another powerful pattern there. And then actually like the thing which is probably the newest one, and also because of the programming styles I said before, is actually the builder pattern. Because, and we will see that also, because, for example, the template pattern is like too verbose. It's too difficult to do it or to have an overview what, what is actually possible. And if you think of using lambdas and so on, template is just not a good choice anymore. So that's why they started to use the builder pattern that you could actually create with a builder um, the clients. So you configure the clients with a builder and, and you have certain blocks which help you actually like to do the right thing uh, with the API. And then the nice fluent interface actually like makes the code also better readable. And it provides quite a lot of um, flexibility and control as well. So that's also a pattern. Right. And then there is a pattern you know also for sure because that's something we love in IT. It's the facade. So if there is something we don't like, we just put the facade on top of it so the world looks nicer, right? <laughs> and then we just can't forget about the technical implementation and we just deal with the facade. And obviously it helps with the cognitive load we have and we just think, yes, we, we do that. And it's like using a calculator, not actually remembering all the math which needs to be done behind the scenes and just like having this nice API. And that's like why we also love abstractions, you know. But you know that is a thing which is maybe nice, but it can be get or it can get quite complicated. We know that. For example, I just put something here uh, in this kind of a meme, like with a process. You have so many processes and at the end you see like what arrives at the customer was not actually like the initial input and maybe you're lucky that it even um, get rolled out in production. <laughs> All right, um, you know this one here as well. So it's basically the same, right? You're just like putting another layer on top if you put them together, the, the babushkas. And um, that's actually the same thing. So we love to do it all the time. Great. So I just now introduced the ideas of this. And let's now dive into code. So for me, um, it's the time actually like where I go into the IDE. And I just show you some code. I'm not like Josh Long who can do like live coding and talking all the time. I'm just a human and a man, right? So um, I'm usually just like limited of doing like one thing at a time. So that's why I actually prepared my code already and I'm going to show it to you and I hope it's, it's quite readable. And we will go like through the different um, types and I explain it to you and I try also like to um, use the IDE as well and show you a few more things. So for example, like this one, um, when we are going into the first pattern, it's like the template pattern. So the template pattern, the most famous one is actually the JDBC template. And the JDBC template, you can actually see that if I scroll here on top. Wow, I was there already, it looks like. So it was here, you see it like 3rd of May 2001. It's like it predates like the first version of Spring, even like before they started on the, on the initial version. Um, it's like a thing which Rod Johnson actually like did very, very early. And for me, this is like really interesting that we are still using maybe such code um, in production. 
The REST template is actually quite nice because you see here um, what I have here implemented is a Lambda expression for a row mapper because the query can take a row mapper and you just like do the mapping of the data from the result set you get and you just create your, your object. But what I wanted to show you is not like how the JDBC template works, it's more like something like this. Because you see here many implementations of the query method. And I mean, we probably have heard that, that it just like, it's just like luck or good design by default that the Spring team or like Rod Johnson and Jürgen Höller knew at the beginning that um, an interface with one method is a good idea. And it turned out we can use that like later with Lambda expressions, right? It was just like coincidence that the, the guys at Oracle just took the route and were leveraging actually like that functionality, having um, interfaces like with one method. Now the funny thing is actually like that the compiler knows that's um, a row mapper. It's just because we have like two uh, arguments because there are two other implementations of the query method which also take um, like one argument and then the compiler needs a hint. So you still have to cast the lambda expression and it's quite ugly, right? Uh, another thing is actually like you can do here in the query method funny things like, for example, oops, I should have done it here, like query for object or query for list or query for stream and so on. So there is like lots of different possibilities. You can even like manipulate the prepared statement and so on, getting like the keys generated um, from the database for your ID and stuff like that. So like it's a very um, extensive thingy. Right. So, and probably it's also the most famous one. And because you know how the thing with the callback works, lots of templates are implemented like this. Okay. So, then actually like, let's go back to my presentation. And that was like the first one. So the, the great thing about it, it, it hides a lot of infrastructure. We have the typical template pattern or template method pattern, like with the second implementation for named parameters, for example. We have a huge list of methods and, and so on. And the great thing is, is definitely you can have like full control over your SQL. Uh, obviously, you have to basically um, use the right dialect for your database. It's not that like a thing it would automatically convert to the right dialect like Hibernate would do and so on. And it's thread safe, so you can have one per database basically. Great. So then there was a time where they thought, hmm, we, we want to make it um, more simple, right? What means simple? So a little bit later, they implemented integrated something, which is actually called this um, implementation here for the um, simple JDBC insert. So if you think writing actually your code is too, yeah, let's say too verbose with all these insert statements, you just can use this um, simple JDBC insert class. You provide a template because the underlying technology is a template. And then, for example, with this bean property SQL parameter source, um, the, the object or the fields will be mapped automatically as parameters. And you just can insert it into a table. And I used here the example that you can generate it uh, with an ID, and the ID will be returned, and you could actually like get something back. Not this one here with the ID, but the next one here is using actually like the key holder, for example, or you could actually directly go to the ID and, and extracted as well from this um, simple JDBC insert. So this is just like making it easier to insert a lot of data and even like batch inserts were done like this. And you don't have to write code as you saw, right? So it's, it's really a nice idea. There is a second one. There is the one which is called this um, simple JDBC call. And this one actually is used to do some um, Let's, let's name it um, functions uh, in the database. And that means like you can call those functions with a name, you can have input parameters and output parameters, and that's basically it. But you have to store the SQL statement basically in the database. 
And it could also like retrieve some parameters out from the metadata. It really depends on the database you're using. The fun thing, or the interesting thing about it, it's something which is there, um, or which was added a little bit later. And it, it got added actually like in Spring 2.5. And it's also like a thing which makes life easier because they thought we need a, a, an abstraction on top of it. And they called it at that time, and I think like Spring 2.5 was around 2006, 2007-ish, um, Fluent Style. And we haven't been talking about that time already about the Fluent APIs. They just called it, it's a Fluent Style and we want to have like a, a, a nicer abstraction on top. I'm not sure if you know about the two things here. Um, they are basically the same, they come from the same time, and they are just on top of the template. And sometimes um, the metadata processing is quite nice. If you have a good database, they can actually guess a few things there automatically. Great, so making things simpler. Now, um, another pattern, if we stay in the database space, is actually like the spring data approach. And there, in 2011, um, they had this idea to basically implement something called like the generic DAO pattern in the Spring ecosystem. So Oliver Drotboom at the time was already doing that with Spring, implemented that like with his own uh, open source project, and then actually like the Spring team reached out to him and said, do you want to contribute that to the Spring ecosystem? Let's make it official. And I mean, 2010, 2011 was a time where NoSQL databases got very prominent. They started um, popping up everywhere. I mean, I'm not saying they were not there, but it became a hype again, right? And since then, they are um, implementing quite a few modules and technologies with this pattern. So just that you uh, are able to see that, oops, that was the wrong key thingy. Um, I have done that as well here in the repository, and that means like you can just like um, def define by keywords in your query. For example, here, find by name contains, and that's like a like statement in, in JPQL. Um, you can generate basically behind the scenes the JPQL statement from that name. And obviously, this name should not get too long, but if you are going to do something more sophisticated, or if you do some things like projections, you can use the query annotation as I did it below, um, so that you have this constructor um, keyword, the new from JPQL, and you are basically mapping the data which is coming back into an object which is actually not an entity. So in my case, the simple entity is actually like an entity, uh, uh, sorry, the event entity is an entity, and the simple event is just a DTO, basically. And for me, actually, also quite nice is that, for example, um, IntelliJ um, knows, because the types are defined up here, uh, it knows about things like that you could do something like auto-completion here, and it just knows the different keywords which could be possible because it knows the entity, it knows the fields in there, and it just like tells you um, wh what is there. But as I said, like the contains actually like it's the thing um, I use for the like statement. I try to replace it. And as you see also here below, I just basically did something similar in that query. And obviously you can also like um, write data to the database and do other things. And it gets even more sophisticated. So you can use that as a nice abstraction. Instead of like implementing the CRUD pattern yourself, it's just done in the proxy. And I think that's definitely the power um, of it. Right, great. So, what's then the next thing? And I mean, I said this was like 2011. There was nothing for a long time until like the last release of the Spring Framework where they introduced something like a client. And people were asking, is there something like the web client we have in the, in the web world, in the Spring MVC world? Can we do something like this? Can we have an abstraction? Can we have a fluent API? And as you can see here, the JDBC client is just such an example where we have this client type implemented. And with the fluent API, you can nicely combine the things you want. Right. You can do things like, uh, for example, here in the query, you say like how things are mapped. 
because like the result set has like the columns, like the, the fields in the object, it will be automatically um, translated. Below, you see the same thing, but I just implemented here um, the row mapper interface as a Lambda expression, and it's basically like the same what we, what we see um, with the JDBC template. Also, same issues there. For example, if I would use a row callback handler or a result set extractor, I would have to cast. So it's just like a nice API on top of it, right? Um, maybe you ask yourself, like, how do I get such a, um, a, a JDBC client? Because I have not been talking about that. It's actually just like a Spring Boot feature, which you could use, and let's Let's give me a second here. Yes, I mean, I just use here constructor injection and Spring Boot with auto configuration actually configures that automatically for you. Same like with the REST template, exactly the same way Spring Boot does it for you, it's there. And if you're going to check like what's below, is you would be surprised because even, or maybe not, <laughs> because even internally, if you would have a look at the implementation, you would actually see that you could create a JDBC client from a data source. You can see also that you can create it from a JDBC template or even from a named JDBC template. And actually like what's used internally is just really like the named JDBC template because um, the JDBC client allows you to use named parameters but also like the question marks. So it just does actually both. And Spring Boot creates that for you automatically, but you could create it on your own, but you don't need to if you, right? If you don't need to. So it's, it's quite a simple thingy. Great. So let's summarize that part. So the JDBC client was introduced in the last version of Spring. It's a Fluent API. We have all the configuration from Spring Boot 3.2. We have the typical approaches, and basically it's a nice abstraction on top of the JDBC template, and as I said, it's using it internally. And it's a new thing, and if you start going to write new code, I would highly encourage you to use the, the client because it's so much nicer actually to read, as you have seen in my examples. Great. Now let's have a look at some web stuff, because there also we have a few clients, and we can go through the same patterns again. Right? Basically, like with Spring um, 3.0, they started to use a REST template. And you know that already, it's there for a long time, and you might be surprised that um, it, it's not getting developed further because it's in maintenance mode. Some people actually say it's deprecated, it's not, they just don't add feature because you could consider it feature complete, right? It uses also method overloading quite a lot, and what we have behind the scenes is like different um, HTTP clients which can be used in combination of the REST template. So there is like the Apache HTTP client, the OK HTTP, and um, you have from the JDK this HTTP URL connection, that would be the default if you would use the REST template, and you don't provide any other HTTP client. And from the new versions of um, Java, you would have the regular or the newer HTTP client from the JDK. So these are possible um, configuration possibilities you have. You just can add a configurer and, and use a different um, HTTP client underneath. So um, let's use that and let's dive into code again. Come on. Here, yes. And let's have a short look at the first at the simple one. I mean, I'm not sure if you have seen that before, how you would create like with um, the Java tools um, an HTTP call. I mean, this is not Spring, definitely not. It's just like the HTTP client from the current version of Java. And actually like, it's not looking so bad compared to like um, what we do anyway with the REST template. The weird thing here is like what I have is I need like an object mapper to translate from an API, the JSON into an object. That's like a thing. But probably you know, you also have to specify classes um, in the REST template, how things get converted, right? So it's very similar like what we have there. And if you use Jackson to doing the, the object mapping, then actually like 
Um, you should also almost know this kind of thing here, this type reference, just to make sure that like the list of events get passed as a as a as a class information, so actually they can use it because usually generics get uh, removed, but on the on the class level um, they stay, so they can read from the type reference these these um, types and then convert the things into a list of events as you see also up here, right? And even the HTTP client here in this example allows you to asynchronous calls, but you also can do synchronous calls. Well, but that's actually not Spring. I just wanted to give you an idea that the Java HTTP client is already like powerful and you could basically do everything you need. Um, with the REST client, or with the REST template, let's start with that one first. As you know, um, you're going to use typically the REST template builder in Spring Boot because Spring Boot provides you the builder. And that's very important. Never do in your Spring Boot application something like new REST template. Why? You have an idea why? Because if you add starters to it, they could change the way the template works. If, for example, if you add micrometer to the to the Spring Boot application, so that means if you add actuator, you have micrometer in there, they can add additional things for metrics. And that means like starters can manipulate the builder, but if you do new REST template, the information cannot be changed or the class, or the instance cannot be changed, but the builder can be changed anytime before it gets injected into your application. So that means like you are going in your application to create the, the instance with the builder and like the customizer can change it. So for example, if you think of like this um, observability stuff, you know, like if you have the, um, the tracing IDs and so on, the metrics information there, that could be weaved in into the template through the builder via customizers. So that's why you're going to do it like this. Um, you also see here like how it's converted. Right, typically like because of the of the information with the list would be gone here. So you have to use the um, array. Or in the example below, I do that with a class which is called parameterized type reference. And there you can actually feed in the information that you want to have a list instead of an array. So you can deal better with these things. Right. So that's actually like the idea here. Great. So the REST template is a nice abstraction but it's actually not so much on top of the HTTP client. And obviously also there are other things which are like Spring related. Um, for example, like the exception translation to a runtime exception. So you would have, uh, or you would get something like an HTTP client exception uh, and not just like a, a checked exception, for example. So it does a bit, but actually not too much. Right, good. So we have talked about the REST template. Then in Spring 5, they introduced something called the web client, and you might be aware of that it uses the reactive stack underneath. So that means like project reactor is there, you have to add the dependency for web flux to your project. And that means like, yeah, maybe you don't want to need to, or you don't want to do it these days anymore. So it's fine for the reactive stack, but maybe like these days you say, ah, oh, I have uh, project loom and these virtual threads and we are good enough with that and not adding too much complexity. Right. So let's have a shorter look at the web client. And for me, the web client is something where you also would get a builder from Spring Boot auto configured. So that means you just can inject it into your uh, application and then you're calling build or you maybe you are adding, um, for example, interceptors or converters or other thing. You still can manipulate the web client quite a lot. And then actually, um, you would use it with this fluent way because for clients, usually we use the builder pattern to, to create it. And then we have the fluent API on top to specify it. And you see, it's not just a one liner, it's very nice, readable, and you can do quite a lot. And in my case here, I just um, I'm getting like from an API a stream of um, events. Or not a stream, really, like it's a, it's a finite list. But if we use the web client, so it, it streams in and the stream will be finished. So the flux is finished. And on the bottom, basically, I just like when I have the result and the stream is finished, it will go through and print it out. So 
That means like you can use the web client um, in a traditional, in a servlet infrastructure, but it would mean you would have to add the infrastructure for Project Reactor underneath. Spring Boot will do that for you, but that means like there is additional threats created for you to actually do that work. Great. Um, well, and then actually like, and let's jump into the next one. This is like the thing which recently got added. It's called the REST client. And the idea was actually to fill the gap. Now, in the previous version of Spring, we had the JDBC client. Now, we, we got the web client. You have other clients like in, 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 in several areas. And they said, could we not have such a nice abstraction with a very similar API like the web client, but just in a synchronous way? And that's like what you see here. So the REST client actually got also um, created by Spring Boot auto configuration with a builder. So you inject the builder, uh, you could change the builder, you could have a base, a, a base URL there, um, you can do more things there obviously, but then you do something like get, post, put or delete, and you just like send the information, right? And you could imagine it leverages the same base infrastructure underneath like the, the REST template. But be aware of the default implementation of the REST client uses the HTTP client and not the HTTP URL connection. HTTP URL connection is something like from the history and they said we are going to use the new API or we can also use like the Apache um, HTTP client and so on. When I was talking about the web client before, I actually said or I missed to say there is actually also um, two options to um, specify the infrastructure below. I think Jetty and Netty both have a reactive implementation of a web client. So you can actually change that if you like, right? And as we do in the, in the REST client, we also have like the options just like to choose one, right? And then you have this nice API and very similar, what you see is basically, I just like scroll down here, if you want to get something back, like a list of events, man, it's the same thing like on the REST template. You still need this parameterized type reference to instruct the REST client to return a list instead of like the array of, of events, right? So basically you see it's just an abstraction on top. We didn't, we, we didn't win much, but actually we can read the things like way better. So that's, that's like the, the thing, yes. Okay, so... Let's go back to my presentation. And yes, you see on my slide, the Fluent API, the auto configuration, and the different um, clients there. And actually, um, the next one I'm going to talk about is something called the HTTP interface client. And the, the nice thing about the HTTP interface client is you don't have to go that low level. You can do more something like um, you do with Spring Data. You specify just an interface and the infrastructure will be um, generated in the proxy for you. Now, the, the nice thing about the interface client is, since like the last release of the Spring Framework, is that we can actually not only use the web client below, but we can also use the synchronous infrastructure like the REST client. And that's really nice because that's actually like configurable. So you can use like one or the other. And I just also jump into the code so you get an idea of this. And I have implemented it like here in this example. And you see here that um, we are going to specify, well, let's start simple. You are going to specify the interface. You say it's a get exchange and get exchange is actually just for the client. It's very similar to what we have like with the get mapping in the MVC controller. And you can specify paths here. You can specify, uh, for example, headers here, like um, when you do request. So here, accept header, URLs, and so on. So you can actually customize those. And that means like if you just specify that interface, now you need to make sure that somehow the proxy is created for you. And what is a little bit weird these days still is actually you have to deal with this HTTP proxy factory to actually like create the proxy for you so that you have afterwards this kind of thingy and you can create from the factory afterwards the, the client. 
And the problem there is, or the problem, well, it's not real problem, it's just verbose, and the Spring, the Spring Boot team has not decided yet to create for you a nice integration, so they will generate that for you behind the scenes, like via properties and so on. I checked yesterday the issue, and there are some discussions going on since two years, but the thing is, like, they recently updated it, I think last week, and they said they are currently discussing it to make it into Spring Boot because we don't want to write that code. So be aware, you could, uh, that thing could change, right? And in the end, what we are going to do is, it's we are just calling the interface method and actually, like, the conversion from JSON to your list of events, for example, will be done behind the scenes just because it's, it's defined on the interface and the proxy will do all the magic for you behind the scenes. It's a really, really nice approach to specify a client without doing, like, everything manually. Right. Then the other thing is actually, like, the, the REST client implementation. Well, actually, there is not much which is actually different. It's basically just like that you say build a for REST client adapter. So we had before in the example I used the, the web client adapter, now you use the REST client adapter, and that's like the way you change the infrastructure. And that means like we are now sticking with the um, synchronous way of the infrastructure behind the scenes. Right. Great. So um, So we got all these implementations, and this is really like the newest one. And I would actually tell you if you're going to do like REST calls, just use the REST client these days. Don't use the REST template. Don't be afraid of the HTTP client. That's also an option. That's fine. But what for me is actually interesting is, is the REST client really a REST client, or is the REST template really a REST template? I mean, probably fancy naming problems like in the early days, but actually, it's just an abstraction on top of HTTP client, and it should be something like HTTP client, right? But um, they, they just stick with the naming conventions they had in the past, like with other things, and that's why it's called REST client. So for me, it's just like fun to see. They are also um, carrying with them like the, the legacy. Great. So um, there are other things like clients you might know. So if you have like a technology in your project like this, say bingo. No, I'm just kidding. Um, also, like Spring Integrations has different integrations with different technologies. And um, I was even interested, for me, it was even interesting to see that I used, like, one point in time a TCP client. And the easiest way to actually, like, just do a TCP connection and, and exchange some characters was actually, like, with Spring Integration. Not dealing with the low level stuff, just like using Spring Integration and super simple. But I skip the code to show you now because we are running out of time. So for me, the thing is actually like the high-level abstraction of the template was great for a long time, and templates are everywhere. So many implementations, you, if you just know one thing, you can actually like apply your knowledge to all the different NoSQL stores, for example. You might have built your own one. That's a thing, right? And the other thing you should imagine or uh, think of when you are building a project next time if there is a builder provided by Spring Boot, use the builder because he has a reason. And think of the metrics information you would pass and things like this, because otherwise you would have to configure it manually. For me, it's a thing, it looks like the templating API is like resilient to time. I mean, it's there since 23 years. It's unbelievable, right? And it's still a good approach to access like external APIs. If you go with clients, I mean, the interface clients are really nice. It hides quite a lot of boilerplate code. You have like interface clients with the HTTP, with Spring Data. There are others, for example, like OpenFain in Spring Cloud, which does the same. So basically also there, if you know how it works, it's always the same, just different annotations. You do the mapping and then it just like works very smooth, right? And the other approach is actually like the clients. And the clients actually provide you more possibilities. For me, actually, also client usually has more functionality just like a template has. Think of things like, for example, if you create a client, you could implement easily something like retry. Or there is a client for OAuth 2 implementation where you, for example, need to have refresh tokens in place, and it will just hide that behind the scenes. Obviously, you can do that also with um, the template, but it's, look, it's not looking nice, 
right? And then you have some examples below, for example, the JDBC client, database client from the R2DBC project, the web client, the REST client. If you think of like uh, using Juke, you also have a client. I mean, the client pattern is also there. And that's something for me is the clients are here to stay. They won't be removed and just use that because it's a nicer way and it's more fluent and better readable. So last famous words, everything is about like the style you're doing, right? So programming style changes, also the way how you're using your tools is changing. And that's why I would say style matters, right? Thank you very much. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer your questions.